Hi, this is Dr. Jeff Klein, editor of Radiographics, and I'd like to welcome you to the first Radiographics audio summary podcast for the July 2018 issue. Each issue, I will be highlighting several of our articles that I feel are of particular importance. In the current issue of Radiographics, Dr. Jordi Broncano and colleagues from Spain and the United States review the imaging manifestations of cardiac vasculitis. Cardiac involvement is particularly common in patients with Takayasu disease and eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis. The paper sequentially reviews findings of vasculitis affecting the aorta and great vessels, pulmonary arteries, cardiac and pericardial layers, including valvular disease, and coronary artery and small vessel changes. The discussion of large vessel vasculitis focuses on Takayasu disease and giant cell arteritis, and typical patterns of vessel involvement are detailed. Examples of valvular disease and coronary artery involvement in Takayasu and giant cell arteritis are provided. In the discussion of coronary CT angiography for assessment of coronary artery involvement, there is a detailed discussion of polyarteritis nodosa, a medium to small vessel vasculitis with coronary arteritis in up to 50% of affected patients, and Kawasaki disease, a pediatric disease which in its subacute phase is associated with coronary artery aneurysms. In patients with eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis, also known as churg strauss syndrome, cardiomyopathy is the most common pattern of cardiac involvement and is characterized by either active myocarditis or endomyocardial fibrosis, the latter characterized by typical findings on late gadolinium-enhanced MR. In patients with secondary vasculitis, connective tissue diseases such as lupus erythematosus and rheumatoid arthritis predominate with pericarditis as a common manifestation. The paper concludes with a review of the diagnostic imaging strategy to be employed based on the clinical suspicion of cardiovascular involvement, with CT and MR most useful in great vessel assessment, coronary CT angiography for evaluation of coronary arteritis, cardiac MR used for microvascular or myocardial disease, and cardiac CT and MR for assessing the valvular and perivalvular structures. From the Department of Radiology, Division of Emergency Radiology at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts, Dr. Jahi Choi and colleagues review a wide range of acute conditions that affect the perineum. After providing a brief review of normal perineal anatomy, the paper details infectious and inflammatory conditions, including perianal abscess, with a focus on the use of CT in this clinical setting. In describing fistula in ANO, the St. James University Hospital Classification System, developed by radiologists on the basis of imaging findings, is reviewed in table form and is illustrated using multiple cases. MR has become the modality of choice in the detection and preoperative evaluation of perianal fistulas, accurately depicting perianal anatomy and characterizing fistulas as they relate to internal and external openings of the primary tract, secondary tract, and associated abscesses. After a discussion of vulvar abscesses, there is an extensive review of Fournier's gangrene, a rapidly progressive and life-threatening necrotizing fasciitis of the perineal and genital region. While this condition is readily diagnosed clinically, CT can be helpful, particularly in evaluating the extent of disease and spread to the abdominal wall and retroperitoneum which helps guide surgical management. A recognition of the sonographic findings of Fournier's gangrene in patients presenting with acute scrotal pain is important as this modality may precede the use of CT in this setting. Urethral diverticula may present with the classic clinical triad of dysuria, dyspareunia, and post-void dribbling, with CT and MR replacing urethrography, which has traditionally been used for diagnosis. Pelvic fractures resulting in perineal arterial vascular injury can produce active perineal bleeding that must be recognized on multiphase CT acquisition. 
urethral injuries are non-life-threatening but common complications of pelvic trauma that require prompt imaging diagnosis to avoid long-term sequelae, including strictures or incontinence. The utility of cross-sectional imaging in the evaluation of scrotal and penile injury is reviewed with examples. In their review paper on the myriad imaging manifestations of sarcoidosis, the authors of Sarcoidosis Head to Toe from five different North American institutions have collected a wide array of cases of this multisystem disease for which the pathogenesis remains unclear. After a review of current thoughts on the etiology and pathogenesis of this common disease, the paper reviews the clinical features of sarcoidosis and the clinical evaluation of patients suspected of having this disease. Given that pulmonary involvement is the most common manifestation of the disease, there is a concise but thorough review of the imaging manifestations in the chest with a focus on characteristic high-resolution CT parenchymal findings. The cardiac manifestations of sarcoidosis, which are the subject of a Radiographics Radiologic Pathology Archives article published in the May 2015 issue of the journal, are well recognized clinically but remain a challenge on imaging, with MR and FDG PET used for both diagnosis and management of those with cardiac involvement. In the central nervous system, involvement by sarcoidosis is commonly subclinical but the authors review the leptomeningeal involvement most commonly presenting with cranial nerve symptoms and signs. Head and neck sarcoidosis, again covered in a subject review of granulomatous diseases of the head and neck by Nwaka et al. in the September 2014 issue of Radiographics, is detailed with examples of orbital, parotid, sinonasal, and thyroidal involvement illustrated. Abdominal involvement is most commonly seen in the spleen and genitourinary tract. After a discussion of musculoskeletal involvement that focuses on joint disease, there is a brief review of sarcoid-like reactions not uncommonly seen both synchronously or metachronously in patients with known malignancy. A final section reviews current indications for treatment of disease, most often employed in patients with extrapulmonary disease, particularly those with CNS, cardiac, ocular, or cutaneous involvement. Superficial palpable masses of the head and neck are common lesions in children. As the first-line imaging modality for these lesions, an understanding of the sonographic and clinical findings associated with these lesions is important and can guide further evaluation but can often obviate the need for further imaging or sampling of these lesions. In this paper from the Kravis Children's Hospital at the Mount Sinai Hospital in New York, the authors begin by reviewing their scanning technique for the evaluation of head and neck lesions. Beginning with the head, the paper reviews neonatal cranial ultrasound for the evaluation of scalp hematomas, craniosynostosis, dermoid and epidermoid cysts, and Langerhans cell histiocytosis. In the neck, the sonographic appearance of normal and inflamed cervical lymph nodes, in particular the progression from adenitis to abscess formation, is reviewed. The typical appearance of benign entities including fibromatosis coli, thyroglossal duct cysts, and branchocleft cysts are illustrated. Cervical thymus and congenital goiter are additional benign cervical masses and must be distinguished from thyroid papillary carcinoma. After a review of hemangiomas and lymphangiomas, the important entity of Lemire's syndrome, a septic thrombophlebitis of the internal jugular vein in patients with oropharyngeal infection, is detailed. Acute parotitis, most often seen in association with mumps, but occasionally due to bacterial infection, is illustrated. As cervical lymphadenopathy is a common presenting sign in children with lymphoma or leukemia, the use of ultrasound and its limitations in distinguishing malignant from benign lymph nodes is discussed. While most neurogenic tumors of the head and neck reflect benign lesions, such as schwannomas and neurofibromas, examples of malignant nerve sheath tumors and neuroblastoma are illustrated, as are rhabdomyosarcomas, which are the most common soft tissue sarcomas of the head and neck in children. 
The chest radiograph remains the most common radiologic study performed in the hospital setting. Given the significant technological advances and expanding use of a myriad of cardiovascular and thoracic devices, radiologists are likely to encounter a broad spectrum of devices radiographically that they must be able to reliably identify and determine if properly positioned and intact. The paper by Segakis and colleagues from the University of Colorado and the University of Texas Health Science Centers at Houston and San Antonio takes a consistent approach to the review of each category of devices, beginning each section with a brief review of clinical indications for employing the device, its actual and radiographic appearances, and device-specific complications. Each section concludes with the MR imaging safety status of the device. The first part of the paper focuses on cardiac devices, including surgically implanted and temporary ventricular support devices, ventricular partitioning devices, and left atrial closure and septal occlusion devices. This is followed by a review of valvular devices, including transcatheter pulmonic, the Melody and Sapien, and aortic, the Sapien, core valve, and portico valves, sutureless aortic valves, the Percival and Intuity Elite, and minimally invasive mitral valve therapy with clips, the MitraClip, used to treat mitral regurgitation in patients at high risk for mitral valve surgery. Endovascular catheters that may be encountered radiographically include the resuscitative endovascular balloon occlusion of the aorta, or ROBOA device, used for managing non-compressible, life-threatening hemorrhage of the chest, abdomen, or pelvis. The radiographic appearance of the ROBOA is similar to that of intraaortic balloon pumps and therefore should be familiar to most radiologists. The endowave infusion catheter for the thrombolysis of massive or submassive pulmonary embolism has a characteristic radiographic appearance as it courses through the right heart to bifurcate into the right and left pulmonary arteries. Ambulatory heart failure monitoring devices, in particular the CardioMEMS heart failure system, placed into the left lower lobe pulmonary artery to monitor pulmonary artery pressure non-invasively are being used to detect the early physiologic changes of heart failure to allow preemptive pharmacologic intervention. The paper concludes with a review of endobronchial valves placed for the treatment of emphysema or management of persistent air leaks and esophageal devices used for pH monitoring or the management of gastroesophageal reflux. Whether you are an academic radiologist looking to create illustrations for an article or book, or you are a practicing radiologist creating a radiology presentation for your clinical colleagues at your hospital or in your region, the ability to create one's own artwork can be a valuable skill. In this informatics paper published in the current July 2018 issue of Radiographics, Dr. Jennifer McCarty and colleagues from Poland and the United States discuss the creation of digital illustrations for radiologists. While many radiology departments do not have access to professional medical illustrators, virtually all radiologists have access to computers and illustration programs and can create basic drawings that even if simple line drawings can convey important concepts to an audience or reader. The paper reviews vector versus raster graphics, an important distinction for amateur illustrators. The steps to create basic illustrations using a program like Microsoft PowerPoint are discussed, and the steps of making a simple diagram of abstract, simplify, and exaggerate are reviewed. Three accessible vector illustration programs are detailed, Adobe Photoshop, Microsoft PowerPoint, and Inkpad for the iPad are discussed, followed by three frequently used illustrations tools common to these programs, including the pen tool, color fills, and the brush. An understanding of layers and layer management is important for the illustrator to grasp. After providing some artistic tips, the paper reviews the saving and exporting of images with a focus on file formats and image size. 
Thank you for listening. I hope you found these summaries helpful. Please subscribe to our podcasts and rate us on iTunes. This helps your colleagues find us much more easily. We greatly appreciate it. Mm-hmm.